is going to talk to us about what being an animal activist uh, animal activist has taught him about effective communication. And I guess I haven't learned that yet because I'm not very effective at communicating. So anyway, we're going to do questions through swap card. But if anyone has a burning desire to have a live Q&A, then we can try to fit, fit that in too. But I think swap card is easiest because it's like you all know it and it's much easier to have a, a clear list of questions. So without further ado, please welcome Ryuji Chua. Cool. Hello. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. So the slides are up. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about engaging skeptics, what animal advocacy has taught me about effective communication. Now, a bit about what I do. So what I do is I make videos. Uh, specifically, I make videos for two purposes in animal advocacy. One is I try to challenge our attitudes towards animals, such that we see them as individuals, no matter what species they belong to. And second of all, I try to expose how much they suffer in the systems that exploit them, and also in other parts like uh, nature, for example. Now, it wasn't always like this. Uh, now I work with many organizations such as Sentient Media, Faunalytics, Search, We Animals Media. And in 2022, the videos that I produce have made 31 million views. Um, but like I said, it wasn't always like this. Uh, I started making videos about 15 years ago. So this is actually, I just found this. This is a screenshot from the first ever video that I made that I posted on YouTube in 2008. Um, I was doing these card tricks back then. That's how I got into making videos. Uh, this is from 2012, the first time that I showed my face on camera. Um, you know, good times. Uh, and this is from 2012 as well, where I made a fake commercial for vitamin water. Uh, this was a, an ad contest that I entered with friends. Now, eventually, uh, I got better at making videos. And in 2020, I made an actual real commercial amongst others that I made. This is for uh, a friend's company of mine who makes these cork bags. Uh, and then I started making other stuff like educational videos. And this is a short documentary I made on fish in 2021. And I had the great honor to be invited onto The Daily Show with Trevor Noah to talk about this particular documentary and animal ethics and fish. Um, so anyways. There is a problem when it comes to communicating in uh, animal advocacy or multiple problems. And here's the problem, right? We want to make educational content. Now, when it comes to educational content, if you want to pick what you talk about, you want something that has these characteristics. You want something to be fun. You don't want it to be controversial. And you want it to be something that people want to think about, right? So if you're making videos about science, for example, you're talking about how gravity works. That's pretty fun. It's not controversial. No one's going to make, uh, you know, get mad at you because you're talking about how if you drop something, it's going to fall to the ground and how that works and stuff like that. Um, and it's also something that people think about. You know, you experience it in your daily life. And knowing how this thing works, how gravity works, is not going to hurt you in any way. It's not going to offend you. In contrast, when talking about animal stuff, uh, it's not fun. It's often talking about extreme suffering that animals endure. Uh, it's controversial, and it's not something that people want to think about. They don't want to think about how their daily choices are causing suffering to animals who haven't done anything to them. So how do we solve this problem? And the question is, how do we take this thing that no one wants to think about and make it engaging anyway so that people willingly learn about it and actually change their attitudes and behaviors. And to figure out this problem, I think it helps us to think about love. Now, when two individuals come together and love each other uh, and look like this, very cute, what do we call them? We call them an item. They become an item. And this is the word that we're going to think about today that I want you to remember. So I want you to think about your audience and your content becoming an item. That's what you're trying to do. And the reason I say item is because, oh, look, there's a cool acronym for item. And the acronym is interesting, trustworthy, easy to remember, uh, easy to understand, sorry, and memorable. I think these are the four things that if you aim to have in your content, whether it be videos, articles, or when you talk to people in general, uh, it's really going to help you in communicating effectively about topics such as uh, animal advocacy. So let's start with interesting. What does it mean to make something interesting? Well, the reason why, before I talk about how to do it, it's important is because oftentimes as advocates, we want to talk about what's important to us. For me, I want to talk about what we do to animals because I'm like, this is an urgent matter. This is important. I want you to listen to this because I think everyone should know about this. The problem is that people in general don't listen to things or don't watch videos or read articles because it's about important stuff. Maybe we do in this room, but most people don't. 
They read things, they watch videos because they're interesting, because it brings them some sort of value. And this is the mindset shift that perhaps helped me more than anything in communicating more effectively in my advocacy. So if there's one thing that you should remember is this, to try to be interesting, to ask yourself when communicating with others, how do I make this interesting? So instead of asking, you know, instead of saying, sorry, you should care about this because I care about this because I think it's important, you want to say, if you care about X, Y, Z, this thing that you already care about, this thing that you already think about, then perhaps you should also think about this or you should also care about this. Instead of asking, what do I want to say? You want to ask, what would be valuable to my audience? What would my audience find interesting? That's a much more valuable question to ask yourself when you're thinking about how to communicate. And now the best skill set that I learned in order to evaluate whether what I'm making is interesting is to honestly ask myself the following question. If I didn't make this, would I still watch it? I try to develop the skill of looking at the videos that I make and asking myself, if I didn't know who I was, right? If I was a random person in the general public who is vaguely in my target audience, you know, not anyone, but someone who maybe already cares about the world, cares about making things better, wants to learn new things, is open-minded, would I find this interesting or would I click off in two seconds? So when making videos, one classic thing, for example, is you'll go film a bunch of footage and maybe there's one shot that you spent a long time trying to get and you try to get the shot perfect, you got the lighting perfect, uh, you know, whatever it is, but you just spent a long time on it. Then you get to the editing room and you want to put that shot in because you're like, I spent three hours getting the shot. How am I not going to use it? But the problem is, if it's not interesting, if it doesn't serve the story that you're trying to tell, then you should cut it out. And this is how we should approach things. It doesn't matter how attached we are to adding this sentence, to adding this thought, to adding this shot. What matters is, does it serve the story that we're trying to tell? And is it interesting? Now, the second thing is trustworthy. We want to make sure that what we're saying is trustworthy. And the way that I think about this is to have the mindset of, I'm not trying to convince people of my point of view. Rather, I'm trying to help them understand the world better, and think more clearly. In other words, what I am doing as a communicator is I'm doing something that's in the audience's best interest. I'm not like, this is something that I believe. I want you to believe it as well. I'm like, this is how I believe the world to be, and this is how I think you can see more clearly, and this is how I think you can think more clearly about it. Now, when it comes to trust, the question to ask yourself is, if I wasn't me, like I said earlier, would I be able to trust this thing that I made, right? And one way to do this is to simply cite and explain your sources with emphasis on explain. So for example, instead of saying something like, we kill north of 80 billion land animals for food every year, you can just add a little thing and say, according to the FAO, we kill north of 80 billion land animals for food every year. And what this does is that it makes it so that the person watching doesn't really have to trust me that I know the thing. They have to trust that I'm reporting accurately, but that's something that can't be avoided. But at least it offloads a little bit of that trust where it's like, okay, this is not what he says. This is more of, uh, he's, he's citing his sources. He's explaining how he knows what he knows. So instead of saying something like, studies show that fish feel pain, for example, you can say, researchers took X number of fish, they did this, they observed that, uh, and they concluded that fish feel pain. And what this does, if you explain the research that you're citing, it makes it so that people don't have to trust you to have interpreted the research like correctly. They just have to trust that you're reporting honestly, and from there, they can think for themselves, does this research make sense? Is it convincing to me? Now, the third thing is easy to understand. And simply put, this is just done by using simple, everyday words. Now, in animal advocacy, there is this word that's thrown around, sentient, right? We'll say animals are sentient, chickens are sentient. Uh, and what I realized one day was that, wait a second, I have never used this word in my entire life before entering the animal advocacy space. I don't think I knew what it meant. Uh, and I don't know if most people know what it means. Maybe I have a subpar vocabulary, but I didn't know what it meant. So I stopped using it. And instead of saying something like chickens are sentient, I would say something like chickens feel, think, and suffer just like dogs and cats. It's saying the same thing, but just with words that everyone is familiar with. And I think this makes things much more easy to understand. And lastly, memorable. 
how do we make things memorable? Now, there are a variety of ways to make things memorable. One is to use slogans and catchphrases, things that people can latch onto. One of them is something I said at the beginning, right? Instead of saying chickens are sentient, try ch a chicken is a someone, not a something. This is a phrase that I use a lot, someone, not a something. And the reason I say it over and over again is because I think it's a catchphrase that's somewhat easy to remember. It's easy to remember an idea when there's a phrase that's catchy that you can you know, easily remember. You can also use comparisons and metaphors. This is particularly useful when you're explaining stats, for example. So earlier, we kill 80 billion land animals for food every year, which is an unimaginably huge number. Okay, but you know, what does 80 billion mean? You can try something like, we kill 80 billion land animals for food every year, that's about 10 times the global human population. That way, you relate it to something that people can sort of relate to, sort of picture. And this is really useful to explain all, sor all sorts of things. In fact, the majority of the way that we understand the world is through metaphors and through comparisons. When we encounter a new idea, we compare it to an idea that we already have in our heads, and we ask, how does this relate? So being able to create these metaphors, these images in people's minds, is really, really helpful. And lastly, we can use examples. Just like I've tried to illustrate all the points in my presentation today with examples, it's always helpful, especially when you talk about something abstract, to use examples to illustrate your point. And to illustrate this, I'd like to use an actual example, applying everything that I just talked about. So this is about a real video that I really produced for an organization, Sentient Media. And this is a prompt, something that we already kind of covered a little bit. Uh, it was about the topic of how many animals do we kill for food every year? We kill about 80 billion sentient land animals for food every year. And this is basically what we wanted to say in the video. It's a short one minute, one minute video. So how do we approach it? This is how we opened it. The first line is we said, whether it's meat, dairy, or eggs, most of us consume some sort of animal product at every single meal. So how many animals does it take to keep up with this demand? This was an attempt to make the topic interesting, in this case, relevant to the person actually watching. Instead of saying, hey, we think, we should care, we think you should care about this because all these land animals are being killed, we're saying, look, this is something that you take part in. You know, we all eat meat, dairy, and eggs, so how many animals do we need to actually keep up with this demand? It's trying to ask an interesting question about this topic rather than simply saying, we well, should care about it because I care about it. Then we go into, well, according to the FAO, the number of land animals we killed globally in 2020 was this, or over 85 billion. Now, this is an attempt to build trust. And in the video, you'll see that we're not just saying this, but we're actually showing that primary source so people can see the numbers for themselves. So they don't have to trust me to get the numbers right. They just have to trust that I got that the source uh, is accurate or that I'm reporting honestly. Then, now I personally can't quite picture that. So let me try to put that in perspective. This is cueing that I understand that when you see a big number like this, it doesn't mean anything to you. It doesn't mean anything to me either. So let me try to help you understand that. Let me make it easy to understand. And then we put a few comparisons in order to explain that. Counting 85 billion seconds would take you over 2,600 years. 85 billion per year is about 2,700 per second, meaning that since this video started, over 100,000 land animals were killed for food. And if humans were dying at this rate, we'd be extinct in 35 days. There's actually another one that uh, didn't make it in here for some reason, but it was something about 85 billion steps would take you X number of times around the Earth. Um, but this, again, using comparisons to make this number more relatable. And then, in other words, 85 billion is unimaginably huge. But in this case, it's not just a big number or statistic. It actually represents individuals. Individuals who, just like dogs, cats, and other animals, feel, think, and suffer. Now, this, again, is trying to make this relatable or interesting in the sense that we're saying, hey, there's a reason why this matters. It's not just a big number, but we're saying, in other words, if you care about dogs and cats, then perhaps you care about these other animals too. So this was the entire script, and for the end of the presentation, we actually have the video that hopefully we'll play. So whether it be meat, dairy, or eggs, most of us eat some sort of animal product at almost every meal. So how many animals does it take to keep up with this demand? Well, according to the FAO, the number of land animals we killed globally in 2020 was this, or over 85 billion. Oh my god. Oh, I knew something had to be wrong. Okay, now I can't quite picture what that looks like, so let me try to put it in perspective. Taking 85 billion steps would take you around the Earth over 15 
800 times. Counting 85 billion seconds would take you over 2600 years. 85 billion per year is 2700 per second, meaning that since this video started, over 100,000 land animals have been killed for food. And if humans were dying at this rate, we'd be extinct in like 35 days. In other words, 85 billion is unimaginably huge. But in this case, it's not just a big number or statistic. It actually represents individuals. Individuals, just like dogs, cats, and other animals, feel, think, and suffer. Cool, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation. I mean, I at least learned a lot about effective communication. And I guess we can just start with questions. So Let's do, it. do you have an effective way to apply the mindset, if I didn't make it, would I watch it mindset in conversations with other people? Yes. So I guess it would be the same thing. I ask myself, um, I, I try to talk with most people uh, as if they don't know me. Or I, I guess the way that I think about it is in terms of prior knowledge. So I feel like oftentimes uh, as advocates, and I've done this mistake many times in the past, is I assume too much prior knowledge on the part of the person that I'm talking to. Uh, and so it basically assumes that this person knows what I know. We have some sort of common ground, and that's where the conversation starts. But I think it really helps to forget that and to be like, they probably don't know what I know. Why, why would they? So for example, um, you know, in particular when talking about animal uh, ethics and animal welfare, uh, I used to say things like, uh, you know, you know, obviously what we do to cows is horrible. Obviously what we do to chickens is horrible and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the thing is, even though a lot of people now have this idea that what we do to chickens is horrible, they don't actually know. If you were to ask them what are the standard practices that we do on chickens, uh, they don't really know. So I don't assume now that people actually know this. Um, and I would try to be like, you know, if I didn't know anything about the topic that I'm talking about, would I still understand what I'm saying? I guess that's how I would uh, apply that mindset. How do you measure the impact of your work on, pu on the public's perception of animal rights? That's a really good question. So the way that I impact, uh, the way that I measure impact uh, is actually not the traditional way that you would measure things. I don't really look at numbers all that much uh, because I don't think that numbers for numbers sake says very much about the impact that you're having. In fact, I try personally to look much more at qualitative data rather than quantitative. So I would rather have people say really meaningful things in comments rather than having lots of views on a video. Because you have to understand that there are ways that you can make videos have lots and lots of views, but it doesn't actually do anything. You know, like if you're just trying to get ad revenue because it's your job, then fine, fair enough. But if you're trying to make a positive difference in the world, you're trying to actually do something, uh, then just having views for the sake of views is not necessarily going to help you. Uh, it's good to have views, but before having views, I think it's important to, to evaluate that the, the, the stuff that you're producing actually has the impact that you think it's having. So for example, uh, the, the short documentary I made on fish, my goal was to have people be like, oh, this changed my perspective on fish, uh, rather than just getting lots of views and people being like, oh, that was sort of interesting. Um, and so that's how I would try to measure things. In terms of numbers, the number that I look at the most is shares. And there are a couple of reasons why I, I do that. One is because I think that someone sharing your content is, in terms of numbers, the, the highest level of praise that someone can give your, your video or your article or whatever. Uh, you know, a view doesn't mean much. So a view on social media, for example, uh, you look on a platform like Instagram, I think it's something like if you watch a video for three seconds, it's counted as a view. So if you scroll through your feed and you see a thing and you just stay there and you don't actually watch it, but you, you go past it, like it's a view. So it, it doesn't actually mean much. But if someone shared your video, that means that they took the time to watch it. They were like, someone else would benefit from watching this. And they actually took the action of sharing it. So I find that to be much, much more meaningful. And the second reason why I, I look at shares a lot is specifically because that's how I think, for me at least, that's my strategy to, to get my content to people outside of my direct community. So 
obviously when you make content about a certain topic, the majority of people who are gonna follow your content are people in your community. That makes sense. If I'm making stuff about animal ethics, then primarily people who are gonna follow me are animal advocates and vegans and people who are sort of interested. But the question is like, how do I reach people who are, who are not in that, it, like in those circles. And the answer is, I'm not gonna get them by having them follow me over a long period of time, but rather I make content that my audience can share out. Uh, and so that they share it with their circles, their friends, their families, their communities. Um, and that's why even when I make uh, videos and a lot of things I talked about today is geared towards making your content shareable. I wanna make it so that someone in my community sees my video and is like, you know what, this would be a great thing to share with my, with my mom, with my friends. Uh, you have a conversation with someone, oh, I should share Ryuji's videos. That's how I try to think about my content because um, yeah, I, I really value shares and I think it's um, one of the best ways to uh, get our content out there. So your video didn't have any call to, calls to action for the viewer. For example, lower consumption of meat or become vegan. How should one communicate that, if, if at all? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's just a choice that you wanna make. So with that video in particular, I was really focused on one of the things I talked about, which is to help people understand the world better and to see the world more clearly. Uh, I really wanted to make it so that I wasn't telling people, this is what you should do, but rather I was trying to tell people, this is how the world is. Um, and so that's just uh, a, a choice that I made. And I think there are, there are pros and cons, right? Like, I guess the, the pros is that a lot of people are gonna find it much more approachable. Or if you have a call to action, uh, all of a sudden, like the video becomes less shareable in a way. Or it's a thing that people watch it and they're like, oh, okay, like you, you explained to me all this stuff, but actually you had an agenda. Uh, which when you're trying to communicate as an educator is something that is really not helpful. Um, and actually, if you look at um, a, a lot of the most successful public educators, public intellectuals, people who, who teach stuff, they don't have calls to action. And that's part of what I believe makes them so successful and makes them so appealing is that they're just saying, hey, look, I'm gonna help you understand the world, not I'm gonna make you change in a way that I want you to change. Um, and so for that reason, that's why um, I didn't put a call to action. And actually, I guess this is just speculation, but I have a feeling that, for example, had I put a call to action, then I think it would have been harder for me to be invited, say, on The Daily Show to talk about it, because then all of a sudden, it's not like a thing about the world, but it's a thing about what I want. Uh, that being said, I mean, calls to actions are also important, because obviously we want people to take action. But I guess my take on this is that if you describe the world clearly enough, and you help people think clearly for themselves, then the calls to action are pretty self-explanatory uh, in a way. Like, it's not necessarily something that, I, I guess my belief is that whether or not I explicitly say the call to action, most people who would have taken action will probably take some sort of action anyways. Um, so that's why like, I tried personally to refrain from putting a call to action, but that's just a choice that we all have to make and you just have to weigh out the pros and cons and like what you wanna do uh, and, then, and then just make a choice. I think that's a fascinating experience, or uh, yeah, it's fascinating. But uh, leading into another question, how would you apply this to other cause areas? In climate change, for instance, what are we doing wrong in our communication? That's a great question. I don't spend nearly as much time looking at how climate activists communicate uh, climate change. So I'm not, like, I, I don't have like specific feedback, but I guess it would be like similar, um, uh, s similar frameworks. So I would think a lot about how to make this interesting to people. Or I guess like one big one is how to make it relatable. When I first learned about the climate crisis, it was this like big global problem. Uh, and it seems so big and so unapproachable. And it's about these things that I don't understand very well. Uh, it's about these glaciers that are far away and, and things like that. Uh, but I think that if we can tell the stories of individuals and how this impacts them, then that's probably the kind of thing that would help um, a lot simply because you know connecting to things that are like planet level uh, and big numbers is, is really difficult whereas connecting to individuals is something that we're wired to do okay how do you see technology such as virtual reality and artificial intelligence impacting the future of animal rights activism that's a great question i mean um i i'm not too sure with virtual reality it seems like there will be opportunities to create uh, different types of content that has the potential to reach people in different ways. So for example, uh, specifically, I always thought it would be really impactful if we could have a virtual reality experience where you can walk through a slaughterhouse, for example, and see all the different parts and see everything that happens and the different stations, the different machines and the whole process. Uh, instead of having it in a video, you can actually walk around and, and see for yourself. Um, I always felt like that would be really cool. 
Uh, in terms of artificial intelligence, not sure to be honest with you. Um, what's a major mistake that you see a lot of animal advocates make? What would you suggest them to do differently? Great question. So one major mistake, I think, is what I touched upon, which is communicating things because you think they're important and screaming at the world, hey, listen to this because it's important. Um, I, I guess you can do that, but you just have to understand uh, who that's going to reach and you got to understand the limits of that, that you're going to create for yourself. I think that you have the potential to go much further with advocacy and specifically communicating to general public. If you think about what are people already interested in? What do people already care about? How can I link this to something that they already think about, that they already care about? How do I make this interesting uh, for them? And making that shift from thinking about, you know, of course, we always want to talk about things that are important. That's actually like a, a given to me. Uh, but I think it really helps us to ask the question, how do I make this interesting? Um, and if you keep asking yourself that over and over again, I think that your communication will improve over time. What do you think about using compassion slash logic in your communication? Do we need a sort of balance between both, or do you think one is more effective than the other? So the real answer is it probably depends on the individual. Uh, everyone is different. Everyone responds to different things. I've met people who are very emotional. I've met people who are very logical. Um, so in reality, if you're communicating one-on-one, -on -one, you always want to tailor your how you communicate based on that person. Um, in fact, I think that uh, people who say that the best way to advocate, especially in like one-on-one -on -one outreach, is this or that, uh, that doesn't make any sense to me because I'm like, we're, we're, we're all different. It obviously depends on the person that you're talking to. So if I'm talking to someone who's very emotional, I'm going to go the emotional route. If I'm talking to someone who's like, you know, a philosophy PhD, then I'll probably go very philosophical. Um, that being said, in general, one framework that I have for communicating is that philosophy is something I find is very useful for me to understand the world. However, when it comes to communicating with others, I find that psychology is actually much more important. So in general, when I'm thinking about how to communicate, I'm not thinking so much about how to be as philosophically rigorous as possible. I'm thinking about how to be psychologically effective. Um, so in that sense, maybe, well, I don't know if compassion, empathy was like linked to um, emotion, but I think it helps much more to understand, you know, in, instead of understanding this is like the philosophical argument that, that demonstrates that we, we, sh we shouldn't be doing this to animals. I think it helps much more to, to understand how do people think about animals? How do they feel about animals? And how can we speak to that instead of the philosophical arguments? Are there any animal charities or any approaches in the animal space you are particularly excited about? Yeah, I, I guess I'm excited about a lot of things that are outside of what I, with what I'm doing. So one thing I, I, I always tell people is that I work on educational initiatives for a general public. But I don't do this because I think it's the most important thing or the most effective. I just do it because it's a very good personal fit. I, I'm really obsessed with it. I'm really obsessed with understanding how to communicate, how to teach, how to explain stuff. Um, but that being the case, like I am way more excited about things like uh, policy work, things like um, you know corporate campaigns, alternative proteins. Um, probably in terms of helping the most animals, I feel like those things will probably help more. Um, but yeah, like I said, so I, I just do this because I think I can do this really well. Whilst this other stuff, I don't think I could do it um, well at all. Well, I think you've answered a lot of great questions, but I just have one for you. Sure. Because. I'm wondering, how do you balance the emotional impact of your work with your own well-being? That's a really great question because I really struggled with it for a long time. In fact, when I first discovered how much animals suffer, I think for about at least like two to four years, uh, I was like, it felt super, super heavy. I think the way that I would describe it is that I would wake up and all day, every day, I felt this weight of this horrible thing that was happening in the world. And I felt like I wasn't doing anything about it and I should do something about it. And every day that I would uh, just go about my life and go to classes and enjoy my life, I would feel guilty and just the whole thing felt super, super horrible. Um, so the two things that really helped me with that is one is a more superficial one is one is a is kind of like a, a deeper one in a sense. The more superficial one is actually putting myself in a position to make a difference. 
So after two and a half years of, of feeling this, I started, you know, finally I was like, the, the reason I didn't do anything was because I, I felt powerless, like I said, and I, I felt no confidence. Like I was like, I don't think I can do anything and I don't know what to do anyways. But then two and a half years later, I was like, I, I'm, I'm going to do this. So I started actually joining organizations and going to events and joining campaigns and going to conferences and, and meeting people and seeing. And so the two things that really helped me there were one, meeting people who believe the same things that I believed, who were trying to do the same things that I was trying to do. And I realized that, hey, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one who feels like that. That was really helpful. The second thing was it put me in a position to actually start making a difference. Um, this is where I think personal fit is, is really, really important to try to figure out, you know, what is it that I can do with my skills and what I like doing that's actually going to help the thing that I want to help with. Uh, and the more I was able to figure that out and the more I was able to see that my work actually has an impact, that really helped me. But the deeper thing was actually to do some deep personal development work. And I think in general, this is uh, pr like probably like the, the overall most useful answer I can think of is, um, you know, well-being is about personal development, becoming the best version of yourself. And I think we should all do that, especially if we're in positions where you have to like think about really horrible things uh, for a large majority of our time. But I remember I did this one particular training that really changed a lot for me. And there was this training about... Uh, about a lot of things, like leadership and stuff like that, but it was also about uh, diving into your past trauma and releasing it. So there was a lot of like inner work that was done. And one exercise we did was about guilt and the guilt that we feel associated with, uh, you know, doing bad things to other people, like cheating on people or lying to people, you know, that kind of thing. And when I did this exercise, the, the, the trainer was like, you know, picture uh, the people that uh, you have run over in your life. And all I could see was the faces of all the animals that um, must have suffered because of my actions. And in that moment, I, I, I pictured that and I, I experienced uh, the, the emotions that I associated with that. That for the longest time, I was kind of suppressing. I realized in that moment. And it was this really cathartic moment where I was like crying and, and yelling. It was, it was very dramatic. And uh, after I did that, I felt light for the first time in years. Um, so like, I'm not sure I can teach this or like tell you to tell you to do this. There's probably different ways like, you know, therapy or, um, some sort of like, like inner work, like release work, like that kind of thing. Um, but that's an experience that I had that was really valuable to me. And the way that I apply this now is that if I feel something intense, I, I try to feel it. Uh, so once in a while, like I'll really think about, you know, what, what's happening. Like, it, could, it could be anything, but like, I really think about what's happening and it makes me feel like really sad and angry and, and frustrated and all those negative emotions. And when that happens, I'll, I'll try as best I can to, to feel it. And sometimes I'll just cry for an entire evening and I'll let myself feel that. And I found that uh, doing that, uh, you know, for, for me, it helps me feel much lighter uh, and ultimately that helps me be more effective. What do you think about nonviolent civil disobedience practices? Can they be useful to the cause or is it not a good strategy in your opinion? It seems to me like it's a, a good strategy, if only because there's a historical precedent for it working. Um, but it's definitely not my expertise, but that's my understanding. Okay. Wow, thank you so much for this extremely insightful talk. I feel like I learned so much about animal activism and about effective communications. So I want everyone to give a huge applause to Ryuji. Thank you so much.